Next. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021, Dr. Cog Board Work Session. Uh, my name is Kevin Flynn. I want to call the meeting to order. Uh, the first item on the agenda is public comment. Let me go back to, uh, we're using Zoom now instead of the uh, other uh, application so we can actually see faces here. Let me go over to the attendees list and ask if there are any members of the public who would like to uh, make a public comment. If you do, uh, we ask that there be no public comment on issues for which we've had a public hearing already uh, before the board of directors. Uh, I'll give you about five seconds or so if anybody, I don't see buddy, anybody on a phone line. So it looks like everyone is using the application. I see one, Andy McKean. Uh, if uh, you, uh, uh, Melinda, can you unmute him so that he can give public comment? And Andy, you have three minutes. Uh, yes, I have allowed him to unmute himself. He just needs to unmute on his end. So Andy, if you can unmute on your end, you'll be able to see. Okay. Can you hear yep. me? We yes, can. we can. And you'll have three minutes. And then at the end of three minutes, I will ask you to make your closing statement. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, contacting you because of Liberty Day, which is March 16th. It's the birthday of James Madison. He'll be 270 years old. And the Congress passed a unanimous joint resolution a number of years ago to encourage all Americans to celebrate and honor Madison's birthday by studying the US Constitution and Declaration of Independence. So we're asking the members of the board to share this request with your constituents and to ask all the people in your community to read, study, learn, and discuss the contents of the US Constitution with their family, friends, coworkers, and anyone else in their network and share this with anyone in the country. It's not limited to Colorado or Denver. This is a national effort. And uh, after the idea is to really immerse yourself in the constitution by reading it, discussing it, studying it and learning it as best you can. My focus primarily is on youth, but everyone needs to really study the constitution in honor of Madison. As you probably know, Madison wrote the Virginia plan, which was the basis of the debates in the Federal Convention of 1787. He also wrote a lot of the Federalist Papers, which were the arguments for the new US Constitution. He also introduced the Bill of Rights into the first Congress in 1789. He was Secretary of State and President. So he's kind of, to me, my role model. Uh, he left a legacy of our country, which we're still living under. Now, after people study the Constitution, what we want them to do is email their US representative, their US senators, which of course is Bennett and Hickenlooper, Governor uh, Polis and President Biden through their websites and share whatever they want about the Constitution, particularly sharing what they learned or if they have any questions on the Constitution or if they wanted to amend the Constitution whatever comments they want to make. The goal is to have our citizens interact with our elected officials. So that's what I'm asking you to do is to spread the word, maybe to work through your PIOs or whoever you have in your community to get to the newspapers, maybe have the newspaper do a story on it, be interviewed by your, maybe on the radio, on TV, interviewed in the newspaper. We're trying to do this nationally we're contacting all our US representatives here in Colorado, all seven, and we're asking them to do a talk about this on Madison's birthday and the evening of the 16th of March. So if any of you know a US representative, we're hoping you will call your US representative or email them through their website. You know, it's perlmutter.house.gov, toget.house.gov, crow.house.gov, negoose.house.gov, buck.house.gov, lambor.house.gov, and bobert.house.gov. So that's why I'm asking everyone to email our representatives and encourage them to talk to other representatives and make this a really national effort. 
as you know, President Biden, when he did his inaugural address, wanted to unite the country. And I can't think of anything better to unite Americans than studying and discussing and going over the Constitution with our family, friends, coworkers, and make this a national effort all across the country. Thank you, Andy. Much appreciated. Uh, are there any other uh, attendees who wish to uh, take advantage of public comment? Seeing none, uh, the only thing I would add to that is, uh, of course, the preamble to the Constitution says, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. The context for that was to uh, revise the, uh, or to move ahead from the Articles of Confederation, where this nation started out as a confederation of states, and it became more of a union of states. And so the context for that is, is very appropriate to reflect on uh, in these days. Let me move on to the next agenda item, which is a uh, summary of the uh, board work session from last month. And I just want to ask uh, the members here, uh, if you've had a chance to review the summary from the last meeting, does any director or alternate have any changes that we need to make? Please raise your virtual hand. And if we do not, we will, uh, we will uh, consider them to be finalized. I don't see anyone. Okay, that appears to uh, settle that. Thank you. Uh, our next item is a, uh, a discussion that we're going to have on uh, CDOT's greenhouse gas rulemaking. Uh, and uh, we have Ron Papsdorf. Uh, is he in the panelists now? Ron? Yes, I see him. Great. Uh, Ron is going to give us a presentation after which we will have a discussion. Ron, uh, take it away. Director Flynn, thank you very much. Uh, board members, uh, glad to be here this afternoon. I, I have an easy job. I just have to introduce some folks um, uh, and, the, and the topic real quickly. So the right. subject this afternoon is a discussion of um, CDOT's greenhouse gas, um, GHG emissions rulemaking and policy uh, work that they're undertaking as a result of um, House Bill 19-1261. The, the board has had some previous conversations about to help frame this conversation. Um, the state agencies are um, embarking on associated rulemaking and policy setting to help implement the roadmap that was the result of House Bill 1261 that was um, adopted by the Air Quality Control Commission uh, gosh, back uh, just in January or so. Uh, so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Teresa Takashi, where is Teresa here, and Rebecca White. Rebecca, did you want to introduce Teresa first? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Rebecca White and Teresa to uh, walk through their, their discussion uh, with the board this afternoon. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Ron. If uh, Ron had the easy part, I guess we have the hard part, um, but really we're um, really grateful to have the time on this work session today. I know how precious uh, time on your agenda is. So thank you for that. Um, you, I think you all know me, Rebecca White. I'm the head of the Division of Transportation Development at CDOT, but I do wanna introduce Teresa Takushi, uh, brand new employee, well, about four or five months in at any rate to CDOT and our first ever um, employee that's solely focused on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so she is a GHG specialist. And just to put some perspective on that, uh, within CDOT, we have paleontologists and archeologists and historians and biologists but to date, we've really never had anyone um, that would help us kind of lean into this topic. So um, really delighted to have Teresa on board and we did not give her a moment to uh, get her feet under her because as Ron mentioned, uh, House Bill 1261 was passed in 2019 that launched an effort um, to develop the greenhouse gas roadmap. And that was finalized uh, just about as Teresa came on and set us on a course to look at uh, a new regulation in the transportation and climate space. So that's what we're going to, to walk you through today. I know a couple folks on this um, call have seen these slides before, I apologize for that, but we are really trying to reach um, anyone and everyone and Teresa will talk a bit about that. We're launching a, a statewide um, outreach process 
thanks to COVID, that's a little bit easier to do in the virtual space. So we've actually been able to talk to a lot of folks. And just to kind of set expectations for you all, we are in the super early stages. This rulemaking is, is on a fast path. You'll see we have a schedule for a draft in May and a final in August, but that puts us, allows us to use this month really for fact finding and sort of initial stakeholder outreach. So what you will see today is sort of a basic framework and intent. And I would uh, love to have an opportunity to come back um, to this group you know, as, as often as you'll have us just to, to provide more detail as we frame this out. So with that, uh, Teresa, I believe we have slides and I don't know, Melinda, if you're able to present those. Thanks, Rebecca, very much. Um, thanks, Chair and board members. I am so grateful to get to be here today and talk with you. Um, so thank you for taking, for taking the time. Um, I'll wait till the slide deck comes up. Um, but yeah, as Rebecca said, I know some of you have already seen these slides, so I apologize, um, but we're hoping to reach as many people as possible. I think we're at um, at least over a hundred people that we've reached already. So with our regional stakeholder meetings, so that's um, great. And we're hoping to um, touch as many people as possible in the future as well. There, I think they're coming, great. So today I'm going to be talking about um, incorporating greenhouse gas emissions into transportation planning. Um, thank you. So I'll start by giving kind of an overview of, of Colorado's climate legislation. Rebecca kind of talked about this, so I won't spend too much time on it, um, but just kind of to frame this conversation. And then I will discuss a little bit of the proposed rules and the policy for the transportation sector and then um, talk about our stakeholder outreach and input. Next slide, please. And I apologize. Oh, maybe it's my formatting. I don't, I'm not seeing the whole slide right now. Let me try to do this a little differently. Looks fine on my end, Teresa. Yeah, it looks like the full slide here. Okay, got it. I just able to format it. Thank you so much. Um, so, for Colorado's efforts to address climate change, um, as Rebecca mentioned, we have House Bill 1261 in the Greenhouse Gas Roadmap. So in House Bill 1261 that was passed in, um, in 2019, we, that House Bill established um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets. And those are outlined here, a 26% reduction by 2025, 50% by 2030, and a 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions um, by 2050 from 2005 levels. And the roadmap really lays out the near and long-term actions um, in every sector in order to meet the established targets. And really that's, um, that's it's not only to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also the air emissions um, that are associated um, with them and also to transition us to a clean energy economy. And I apologize, they are still cut off on my end. So I'm, I am struggling a teeny bit. Let me get this as I'm sorry, hang on, bear with me for just a moment. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you so much for your patience. Um, so that the greenhouse gas roadmap um, was a final was issued just in January and that's available on the Colorado Energy Office website. Next slide, please. So this was actually taken straight out of the roadmap, but kind of gives you a sense of the sectors and um, the, the, of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Colorado. So in 2005, the largest emission source of, uh, largest emission source in Colorado was electric power and transportation was actually the second largest source. Um, in 2020, that has actually shifted. So now transportation is the largest source with electric power being the second largest source. And you can see in the pie graph kind of how that's broken down into um, different sectors for each of those um, each of those larger categories. Next slide, please. So this this graphic really is just showing where we're trying to um, where we're trying to go in order to achieve those greenhouse gas emissions reductions that are laid out in the roadmap and in House Bill 1261. 
So if you look at that red line, um, the circles along the red line are where those targets are. And if you look at the actions that are already underway in the 2019 action scenario, you can see that we've actually made um, significant pro progress to, to getting to our, um, our 2025 and 2030 goals, but we, um, we still have more to do. So we're about 50% of the way there, um, but there's definitely more to do. Next slide, please. So when in the roadmap, as I mentioned, there's the roadmap lays out near-term and long-term actions in the transportation sector. And this is a list um, that's taken from the roadmap, but the focus of um, our efforts and why we wanted to speak with you today was um, this, this first topic area, that's the greenhouse gas pollution standards for transportation plans. So that's really um, why we wanted to um, talk with you today and talk with all of our stakeholders and to get input on this um, initial piece. You can see there's many other um, aspects that are listed here. Um, specifically, the trip reduction piece is um, actually being um, dealt with through a separate process. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the process in the next few slides. But again, we're focused on this greenhouse gas pollution standard for the transportation plans. Next slide, please. So as far as our regulatory approach, the, um, this is kind of being done in two, in two formats. So we have um, the Air Quality Control Commission and we have um, the Transportation Commission. So the first piece is that the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission is appointed by the governor and authorized by the Colorado General Assembly. So the AQCC develops air pollution control policy and regulates pollution sources. And the AQCC is actually taking up a series of rulemakings across all sectors to address greenhouse gas emissions and implement the recommendations of the roadmap. And one of these rulemakings will focus on the transportation sector. The Colorado Department of Transportation and its governor appointed Transportation Commission has the statutory authority over transportation, the transportation planning process. So this process is guided by a series of policy directives that are is issued by the Transportation Commission. And this greenhouse gas pollution standard will include actions by both of those bodies. Next slide, please. So when we look at the timeline, and again, um, Rebecca mentioned this, but it is, um, it's a quick turnaround. So we're looking at a request for hearing in May and a final rulemaking hearing in August. And what will be going through the Air Quality Control Commission rulemaking, as I said, was a, is a kind of a transportation bundle. And one aspect of that is integrating greenhouse gas pollution standards and analysis in regional and statewide transportation plans. So the greenhouse gas pollution standard. Um, there's other measures that are part of that, um, but again, that's the focus um, that, we, that we want to um, talk about today. And then in parallel with that, CDOT will be developing a policy. And this will be, this is kind of how it will be implemented. And it's, um, it will be, again, specific to the greenhouse gas pollution standard and specific to um, the transportation plans. Next slide, please. So this is kind of where we are right now. And we, we're really in the initial thinking um, phase. So we, again, this is where we're seeking feedback and really want our stakeholders to engage us early in the process so that um, we can go in and develop the best rule and policy. So the idea is that we would set a numeric greenhouse, greenhouse gas budget for transportation plans. And we would start statewide. So looking at a statewide budget. Um, and then we, we want to do this in the best way possible. We wanna be really thoughtful. And so the idea is that we would have a phased implementation with an initial focus on certain MPO plans. So we're looking at the, we're looking at the areas that have the most greenhouse gas emissions and the most the most people. So that's kind of where what we're thinking as far as laying it out. And we really want to focus on projects that increase capacity. So again, we're looking at we're looking at big sources of greenhouse gas emissions. So the work that CDOT does, the safety work that we do, is we're going to continue to do that. Um, the purpose of this role is really to focus on um, those large, those large um, projects. And the CDOT guidance will really focus on the practicalities of how the policy translates into specific project-based requirements. So the idea is um, there's, well, and I will talk about this a little bit more on the next slide, but there's, there potentially could be in a way to include other measures in order to meet the budget. So the next slide is kind of shows this a little bit more graphically. 
So when we talk about our statewide, statewide transportation plans, we're really talking about the planning process. That's step one. Um, and so that's where our initial thinking again is that's where the budget piece, of, piece would apply to is that step one but that there would be opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in any of these other sectors. So when you look at um, environmental analysis or NEPA, um, you could also look at project design and contracting or project construction and operation and maintenance. So the idea is that um, you could find ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in any of these sectors. And so that could be a way to meet that budget. Next slide, please. So this is kind of this is kind of again where we're seeking feedback. We're curious what what questions, um, especially you know, we're curious what questions you have, what concerns you have. We're looking for um, pointing out like what challenges you see as important for us to address as we're developing this rule and policy. And then we also want to be sure that we're touching all of the stakeholders. Um, so we want to make sure that we're reaching out to stakeholders that would be interested um, and have valuable input into this process. Because again, we feel like the most, the most diverse impact, input we can get, the better role and policy we will have. So I will talk just a couple more about kind of process, and then we'll come back to the slide as far as questions, if that's OK. Um, so the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about, so we've had regional meetings. Um, as I mentioned, we've had. Um, many different regional meetings. We also have a CDOT advisory group. So we have a standing advisory group. And again, some of you are on that and we really appreciate your time um, in order to be on that. And really the idea behind that group is to meet every more frequently. So every two weeks. And the idea is to really um, kind of check in to see where we are, what, what progress we've made, um, how things are looking and kind of to check what, are we, what, are, what, what do we need to think about. So that advisory group has been really helpful. Um, we also have been working very collaborative, collaboratively with CDPHE and CO. So CDPHE has ha been having listening sessions. And um, that, although that, that date is, um, they actually have bumped that one out there. They have some upcoming listening sessions um, that they are going to be doing that are focused on looking at um, equity and dispropor disproportionately impacted communities. So those are upcoming as well. Um, and then as I mentioned, we have uh, another opportunity to hear from all of our regional stakeholders in April, but we're welcome to other ideas on our process. Um, so to the extent that you have ideas about that, we would love to hear from you as well. And then the last slide is my contact information. So again, many of you have um, seen, seen this presentation or are aware, um, but if you would like to be more, um, participate more, um, please reach out to me and I'm happy happy to include you on any of those regional meetings. Um, we are really excited to, to hear from all of our stakeholders. So uh, I'm not sure if we wanna go back to the questions or if we want to, um, yeah, let's do that. And then we, again, we are really excited. Um, we would love to, to hear what you're thinking. Thank you for the time. And Certainly. Teresa, if, if I could just add, um, Chair, if it's okay, I. I put in the chat a uh, link to the CDPG website that has the upcoming kind of public listening sessions. Um, they're particularly focused on, on equity issues, as Teresa mentioned. And then also, I do want to acknowledge for that advisory board, we tried to be very, or advisory group, very thoughtful about including Dr. Cog. So we have uh, Director Stolzman on there, Director Maurer, as well as Ron Papsdorf. And I want to, to thank each of the three of them for the time they've already given us and will give us in the future. Excellent. Thank I you, hope. Rebecca. <clears throat> and thank you, Teresa. Uh, I assume everybody by this point after a year is familiar with the raise, the raise hand function on Zoom. And if we're all using the same uh, version of it, uh, the raise hand function should be at the bottom of your screen along that menu. And as Rebecca mentioned, there's also the chat function. I have first, you know what, uh, in order, I'm going off the participant list over here. Uh, I have Director Levy uh, up first. Director, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, and thanks for the presentation and, and the work that you're putting into this. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I think I have two questions and I'm just going to go ahead and ask them now. Uh, I gotta get my cursor back on the right page. Um, so I know you said, so this is on page 14 of our packet. I don't know what page of your slide it is where, where you talk about the near-term transportation actions that are included in the 
greenhouse gas roadmap and you know you did indicate that the infrastructure planning and projects component is what you're really focusing on now or the focus of this meeting but um, every time I see a reference to um, land use decisions and incentivizing land use decisions by local governments um, I, I scratch my head because there's I don't know that we've figured out how to use incentives at the state level for, for good land use planning, compact development that, that fosters multimodal transportation. And I, I really would love for there to, you know, to just be some greater explanation of this and this isn't the time for it maybe, but I know it, it comes up later um in the second part of the agenda and it comes up all, all the time and I, I think we really have to start figuring this out and it may take some a, a paradigm shift um in you know because we're a local control state but just one thing that I tried to work on um over a decade ago was to have um some a aspect of transportation funding tied to um, a demonstration that the um, that land use plans are not going to increase vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions, particularly if they're to fund new capacity and and might be used for new development. So I would just I would like to hear more at some point about how we actually do that. The other the, my other question it maybe just reflects my own learning curve that I'm on here regarding the how funds are um, allocated and where we talk about setting a numeric greenhouse gas budget for transportation plans statewide and you know and then there are obvious implementation issues but given how long projects have to sit and be in the pipeline before they even get funding um, how how would this actually work uh, you know, we have we have projects that have been on a list for a decade. Um, now we have a greenhouse gas um, budget. Those projects have been designed. Maybe they're not uh, very good for reducing greenhouse gas emissions or reducing um, uh, vehicle miles traveled. So how how do we how do we factor this in now, given that so much of our transportation planning has been in place for such a long time. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, you wanna take that? Yeah, uh, thanks chair. Uh, thanks Dr. Levy, that, wow, what a great set of questions. Um, let me take your, your second one first, uh, cause that is a really key question. And I'll tell you from CDOT's perspective, we're, we're very much facing that, that same, um, and the conundrum is not the right word, but that same situation. We have our 10-year plan, which you all um, know well and worked with us to develop. That's our statewide list of projects for the next 10 years. And we are very committed to delivering that. So I, our thinking is that, you know, knowing the importance of greenhouse gas emissions and this new standard, where we still want, we still intend to keep to those projects. What we would look to do though, however, is within the context of those commitments, I think that there's a whole bunch of, of changes we can make. And Teresa showed you that kind of life cycle chart. You know, we can look at adding more transit elements to projects. We can look how we deliver them through construction. We can, we can look at how we operate and maintain them on the back end. So, you know, just, just having a project on the list is certainly a start and important, but then that project goes through the NEPA process and a whole bunch of ancillary decisions are made that really determine the overall footprint of that project. So I think that's why we, we do have to look at it holistically. The other point I would make is, you know, we do amend and adopt plans. Um, Dr. Cog does that, CDOT does that. So certainly going forward, we'll have an opportunity to to apply this lens uh, more from the very beginning. But I think uh, we all need to balance this. And that's why CDOT was really happy to kind of be uh, in the driver's seat with this because we, we understand like you all do uh, what the role of planning plays and the commitments we've made. And I, I think we can strike the right balance and make a big difference. Um, your first question is, is a much longer one. Um, I think there will be more discussions on land use 
I think CDOT might actually be convening kind of a year long stakeholder process on that. Uh, but uh, we needed to get this rule going and out the gate first before we tackle that uh, that monster topic. But it, I think you're right. We, we're gonna have to lean into that. Thank you. Um, next up, I have Director Brockett, Aaron. Hi, well, Commissioner, uh, Director Levy, thanks for those questions. I had a similar one, but I'm gonna approach it slightly differently. So the, so I hear, um, uh, Teresa, and by the way, thanks again also for that presentation. It was very informative. Um, the 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 ten year plan is one that you're intending to still implement. My question is: so, Dr. Cog, as you mentioned, also has uh, plans, and so we're working on the revision to our um, regional transportation plan right now. But it's a longer term uh, plan, you know, thirty years. So, um, to what extent might um, these greenhouse gas budgets you know, become an input into the plans and re potential revisions of them? Like, would we, do we know how that might work or, or how we, whether we might get a certain budget for increased in emissions over time or decreased emissions, I guess is what we have to do, right? So budget for decreased emissions and then show how the, the long-term plan would, you know, create those or reduce those emissions. Do, do you have a sense of how that's gonna interact? Chair, are you okay if I just take these questions? Yes, or? Okay. yes please. Uh, thanks, Director Brockett. So another good one. Uh, that is one of the reasons I'm so very happy to have Ron Patzdorf on our, our working advisory group um, to be able to help us think through that. Um, and I'm, I'm very well aware where you all are in, in terms of being very close to adopting the um, RTP. Um, I also know you've done a, I believe you all have done a greenhouse gas analysis of that plan. So there's already been some work to look at that. And we'll have to then sit down with Ron and figure out those exact mechanics. And like I said, we're, we're at the early stages, but that's already one of the flags we've placed is, is how does a requirement like this factor into your all's efforts and the analysis you already do and what more this might require. Thank you. Okay, that's good to know. And if I could just ask one more question. Um, so, you know, obviously we're in a unique period uh, in our history here with the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been uh, increased working from home, you know, during this period, which, and I assume that transportation demand management is going to be a big piece of your planning over time, right? Because if you're talking about, say, still building the 10 year plan, but then adding in mitigation measures, you know, then, then TDM plans are gonna be, I imagine a huge component of that. And how quickly are you thinking about diving into things given that we have this sort of unique situation right now of, um, you know, encouraging continued teleworking or helping companies make the transition, you know, uh, back to more normal times, but in ways that, that continue to reduce uh, vehicle miles traveled? So, um... You know, Teresa mentioned, I think it was in an earlier slide, that there's actually several components to this rulemaking that's before the Air Quality Control Commission. And actually one of the other pieces is to look at how um, we can encourage, require major employers to look at, at helping their workforce um, do uh, reduce single occupancy trips. That rulemaking is being um, managed by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. So the, our sister agency, you know, CDOT's role up to this point has been to help fund transportation demand management um, and encourage that work and kind of align it with our transit services. We're very much planned to stay in that space. Um, we, we focus a lot of TDM right now on our construction projects, but are starting to look at it too for long-term at interchanges. So more to come on that. And I, I think you all will start to hear more about what TDPHE is thinking and where the RAC, the Regional Air Quality Council has also been doing a lot of work in this area. So that's more in their bucket, um, Director Brockett, but I can help direct you um, to those folks as well. Okay, thanks for that information. And, and I'll just leave with a comment that um, it's exciting to see uh, this initiative being undertaken. I'm really glad to see an expert on uh, emissions at CDOT. So look forward to the future stages of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Director. Next up, I have Director Teal. Thank you, uh, Chairman, appreciate that. Um, my question um, really has to do with sort of the inverse of what we heard from uh, Director Brockett and Levy. Mm -hmm. 
in terms of for those of us who have large rural areas, for those of us that are on RTD's periphery, I mean, um, and, and as we're seeing over this last, you know, not just year, but several years, how RTD is sort of concentrating more into the core of the system as opposed to these outlying areas. I mean, um, is there any thought to um, when, when building this uh, scoring system to taking that into advantage for those of us, you know, counties that actually have large rural areas uh, that do uh, are on the periphery of RTD, are on the periphery of transit in order to make sure that, you know, our projects aren't uh, adversely affected um, by the, the lack of uh, multi-level um, transportation capabilities. Yeah, Director Teal, thank you for that. Um, a couple of perspectives there. I do wanna note particularly for rural parts of the state, um, an important, uh, one of those kind of assumptions we put up here in earlier slides is that this, at least at, at this point in how we're thinking of this, this, this policy would not apply to our standard paving projects, fixing potholes, guardrail, repaving, kind of the bread and butter of a public works and, and Colorado Department of Transportation work. That really isn't what this is after. This is this would be more focused on, you know, to use the, the language I think you all know, um, projects of regional significance, big projects that really move and change traffic and have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And we feel really strongly about making that distinction because it is such a different uh, situation in, in some of the rural parts of the state. You know, your, your question about transit, I think that's a good one. Uh, CDOT's certainly trying to lean into rural transit with our outrider service, but you know, we have to maintain a, the boundaries with RTD. And I don't know that I could speak very wisely um, to how we better fill that gap, but I, I certainly understand the point you're making. Well, good to see that. I mean, good to hear that it's a um, it, it is an item that is still being considered because, you know, I mean, we all know uh, the gap uh, project, the South I-25 project mm -hmm. that runs right through the southern portion of uh, here in Douglas County. And, um, you know, uh, not a transit uh, serviced option, I, I don't think at any time until we start getting somewhere with the front range rail. And even then, it's a uh, it's a piece of the puzzle that's still critical, I think, in terms of the transportation network for the state. Yet, you know, again, all this, it, an area that I always hear concern about from the folks that, that I represent down here. Yep. Thank you, Director Zettel. Yes, sir, thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have Director Peck, go ahead. Thank you, sorry, it took me a minute to unmute that. Uh, I wanna echo everybody's uh, comments. They're all really good and they address the issues at end. But um, I do have, what I am hearing is that in order to really reduce greenhouse gas emissions, this has to be a mass. I'm sorry, did we lose? Oh good, it wasn't just me. Did we lose Director Peck? We did. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, let me move on and when she comes back in, I'll, I'll fit her in up the top. Uh, Director Odoricio, I have you up next. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the things that we look at in Adams County, I know our core areas, Adams County along Federal and all the urban areas, you know, it, it's we have a tell a tell of two communities, right? And so where the areas that are already built out you know, can really love to embrace um, multimodal, we're going to embrace, you know, transit and things like that. But we also still also have a large urban pop, uh, suburb, suburban, suburban and rural. Mm -hmm. But in the rural areas, it's still where we get our food, our parcels, that's where the distribution centers are, that's where everyone in this call takes their trash. I mean, there's still a lot of freight and movement of things other than people. And so what my question is, is even the even the most uh, built out communities still rely on the outer lying communities to get stuff to and from their community. 
We need the products. We need the food. We like Amazon to deliver to us within 72 hours, 24 hours, or four hours. But we also want to make sure that somebody's taking our trash to some other community. How are we handling the movement of things other than people? See, awesome question. Um, so, you know, there in this way, it may have been where Director Peck was headed of that it's going to take multiple solutions to solve this. Yeah. And this, this planning rule is going to get at a slice of it for sure. But the vehicles that we drive is a huge factor. And I say that both for the passenger vehicle side, but also for freight. And so in this area in particular, we've launched with the Colorado Motor Carriers, um, the clean freight work. Um, I feel like maybe you've been even a part of <laughs> Commissioner Odoricio, but I, I think there's a whole lot of um, future there to electrify freight, to look at, at adding electrification in. And I think that is a huge, exciting area that is, is a separate slice of this. And I, you know, probably one of the challenges is how do we add this all up and best quantify the emission reductions we can make from each of these strategies? But I think that's where the, the focus on freight really is. It's operations as well and platooning and things we can do with, within the sector. But absolutely, and you know, I think one thing we saw during COVID is just how reliant we are on freight. It, it is, and, and, and if I might, Kevin, if I just, just to follow up with that is that we just don't wanna penalize those communities that serve the inner core. And that's what it sometimes comes across if we're not careful. And I think as long as we know that we are an interconnected, interdependent system of communities with different roles, I mean, uh, until every community wants to have their own landfill, until every community wants to have multiple Amazon centers, we're gonna have to address that. And I guess that kind of brings up the other one is, our, when we're dealing with um, growing communities, how do we also allow other communities to grow rather than just saying, okay, we're all done with growing and we've decided no more growth for other folks. I mean, smart growth is important, but how do you also say to folks that are on the outside that says, wait, it's our turn. Can I plead the fifth on that one? <laughs> yeah, I, I see okay. the point. Is that all, uh, Director Odoricio? I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. I see uh, Director Peck is back with us. Uh, let me bring you back up, uh, Joan, uh, to uh, finish. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Uh, my computer's kicking me out of all these Zoom meetings. I think it's Zoomed out. Um, <laughs> I'm taking it into IT tomorrow afternoon. Um, so Excellent. to continue, um, the way I see this is that if we really want to attack the greenhouse gas emissions, this is going to be a mass transit issue to move people in mass. Um, so my, uh, my question actually is, are we, when we are considering, considering multimodal, because that is now part of CDOT's, rail is now part of CDOT's multimodal plan. It's just not ped and bikes. Are we um, considering rail in this greenhouse gas emissions because it is the governor's vision as well as our president's vision? Um, and since this isn't going to be finalized until August, perhaps that funding coming down, I, I don't want you to just exclude that as that is not part of, of the plan, it really should be. Um, the other thing that I was wondering, because you said that CDOT's plan was to fund transit, is there any way or mechanism that CDOT would help RTD move mass transit, for example, um, in capital costs uh, for buses or how does that work? Do we give do you give money to RTD for specific services? I would like I would like RTD to be back up and running as fast as possible to um, help in the short term to reduce some of these greenhouse gases and 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 have a better marketing plan. So um, that's a challenge I see. So could somebody answer those things? Go ahead, Teresa or Rebecca. Sure, and I I. Um, I think Bill Van Meter is on. I don't know if he wants to add. And certainly the second question, I would I would look to his help um, because we do partner quite a bit with RTD okay. uh, and work together whenever we can. I think a good example of that is often where um, we build corridors and like with US 36, we added an express lane 
and made sure that that lane was open to RTD and in fact that they had um, preference for keeping their operating terms on times on that. Um, but I, I would want Bill to chime in on your second part of your question. The, the first is, you know, we're certainly going to look at um, different scenarios for how we get there. And we have run and, and will continue to run scenarios that look at uh, front range passenger rail, um, nor, you know, full build out of Northwest Rail, just like uh, Dr. Cog has done um, scenarios around really a massive expansion of transit. I think what we'll find is that doesn't solve everything. We still need to, to look at the projects we build, the cars we drive. But yeah, um, the short answer is yes, we'll, we'll certainly be looking at a um, whole host of investments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have uh, Director Mulvey. Hi, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, to tie into um, Director Teal and Director Levy's comments, my question, or rather it's a comment in request to the extent that you've asked for input on the rulemaking process and recognizing, of course, this is only for projects of regional significance. If a um, area is growing and didn't previously have a greenhouse gas um, problem, an excessive measurement by which we could reduce with a zoning decision or some other decision, we don't have a baseline. How could we um, meet the standard? So if that could be considered in the process, we appreciate that. Um, in many cases, the zoning decisions will have been made years ago and cannot be changed and particularly in short order. And the funding mechanisms by which the developers are obligated would also have been in place for years as well with triggering mechanisms. And so we would hope that the rulemaking process would account for the fact that we don't have a baseline, but we would still want to comply. And how, we, how might we do that? Obviously metering, into an intersection might work. I know that we could probably exemplify how our prior dis zoning decisions played into um, a greenhouse gas reduction framework, but there's nothing to reduce. So if that could be considered, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. Hart. I'll just yeah, add quickly, you know, okay. because greenhouse gases are, um, aren't a localized pollutant, it, that really allows us to look at this at a very high level at the statewide and regional level and look at an entire basket of projects. And so that, you know, and it, it allows for, I think, individual circumstances like you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how many others it might impact, but it might be quite a bit in growing regions such as Douglas County or Adams County. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Next up, I have Director Kelsey. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to make a comment from um, one of the mountain communities, um, Georgetown. And um, I, I understand fo having your initial and primary focus on the larger population centers, because that's where your um, largest emissions, at, particularly from transportation are coming from. But you also have, as um, Director Teal mentioned and Director Odoricio mentioned, you've got these uh, spokes coming out from there, um, particularly the I-70 corridor. And I just wondered, um, last I heard, um, there was there the measurement of our air quality going up the corridor wasn't very consistent, and so it would be really hard to. Um, I mean, I, I I see the numbers. I see the traffic on the highway in the in, on the weekends, and particularly those long holiday weekends. But it's getting heavier during the week as well. And until you start measuring those outlying areas, how do you know if you're 
ignoring a equally important area. Yeah, that's a, a tough question. And, and that sort of gets to the, the difference between the, the criteria pollutants like ozone and particulate matter versus greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but the sources are the same and, and, and we can um, use both monitoring. And, but what will come into uh, play here for this rule is really modeling. Because what we wanna do is project what's going to happen in the future, how much people are going to drive and how much the projects we're building contribute to that. And for that, we really rely on the travel demand model. CDOT has one that we, we like to say we stole from Dr. Cog, but we use the exact same approach where we have a, a, it's, a it's all built on guessing consumer behavior and, and projecting how much people drive. And it really does give us as good a picture as we can about what happens in the future with greenhouse gas emissions. I, I can appreciate that, but then you also have as population grows and we've last summer during the pandemic, we saw a lot of people desperate to get out and do something. And we had a lot of visitors up in our territory and I don't see that reducing until there are more mass transit options going through this corridor. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Anything else? Okay. Uh, next up, I have Director Walton. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, one comment I have. Um, that kind of stems from a concern, but not a concern based on what I heard today, but just how we look at equity um, in these conversations. Um, so I am applaud and encourage your comments about um, the focus on equity, especially as we are introducing new technologies in transportation. Um, one of the thoughts I have in the question um, on the screen, who else? should we include. Um, I was wondering how you include consultant types and firms who are working with um, municipalities to develop comprehensive plans and transportation mm -hmm. plans, um, because it would seem to me they have a unique perspective and could um, influence something that maybe they don't see in an RFP from a community or um, being sure that they are um, looking at not just what that local government is prioritizing, but understanding and introducing into the conversation the importance of some of these regional and state conversations if they don't see it in the work or in those, um, those scopes. Thank you. Thanks, Director Walton. Uh, you know, we've most directly been working with the ACEC. I'm gonna bungle what that acronym means. Um, Teresa, can you help me? It's the group of, of sort of engineering consultants that do a lot of our NEPA work. And I believe it's that same group that does a lot of work with municipalities. Uh, does anyone recall what ACEC stands for? American Society of Civil Engineers, is it? I see, no. We're close. But, that's um, but Director Walton, if you have a, another, it's really helpful for us to grab those roll up trade associations. So if there's a group that um, we don't know about, I would love to have that contact and we'll absolutely reach out. Thank you. Uh, next up is Director Maurer. Director, you're still muted. So good, thank you. Sure. Um, and thank you, Chair, and thank you, Rebecca and Teresa. Um, I think there's a lot of cities and counties that have encountered a very similar problem that we have, and that's the loss of a lot of our shopping areas, and they're just vacant buildings right now, and we see it wherever. So we're looking at, you know, redevelopment in some of those areas, and, and so we're looking at, you know, land use and zoning changes. And, you know, the, the two developers that are coming to us, the two types are for apartments and for fast food restaurants. That seems to be the thing. 
Um, not everybody's happy about that, but that's the way it is. So when we're having those conversations about land use and zoning is, is there, I'm hoping to see maybe we can have a discussion about that and how that fits into, um, you know, future plans and, you know, is there quality? Thank you, director. That's a great, great idea. Thank you. Surely, okay. Thank you, next is director Stolzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to thank Rebecca and Teresa for taking us through this today. I think it can be a little bit daunting to see that we need to achieve this 90% reduction in emissions. And, and, you know, like Director Odoricio was saying, that's gonna mean bringing everyone to the table. That's gonna be trucking, that's gonna be vehicles, that's gonna be mass transit. That's 90% reduction while our region is still growing is a big obstacle. And so I can see why people might shy back from it, but I think we just all need to start thinking and realizing we live in an innovative region. Like we have wonderful people in Colorado. We have a really great history of collaborating. At least that's what we tell everyone else. So we can make it true and we can really tackle this, but it, it won't be easy if we don't all lean into it. We don't all work on it. So I think, you know, start thinking about this. We need to start thinking about how do we make this work for our areas? How do we make this make life better? And that's our Dr. Cog, Cog motto, right? It's like, we make life better. So this is, things are gonna change and we wanna all make sure we make it change for the better. And how do we make it work for everyone? How do we make it equitable? How do we make sure that we're not leaving any areas behind that people can still reach their individual goals, but collectively we can get this 90% reduction. And I really do think we can do it. And there are technologies existing and there are technologies we're going to need, but we're gonna need to all work together and think about like, hey, who wants to start recruiting electric vehicle companies to Colorado because we're going to need a lot of electric vehicles and like hey how can we start piloting different vehicles within our fleets with each other like if any of you have tried a fleet vehicle that you think is great our our director of fleet in Louisville doesn't like them so far <laughs> so you know I think we need to start sharing these experiences thinking about land use like some of you have talked about thinking about purchasing choices economic development choices so that we can get to this 90 percent greenhouse gas emissions reduction so i very much am excited for the future and i'm looking forward to figuring out how to make this all work so like, i'm just eager to get started so let's go thank you uh, don't know that that requires a response rebecca but uh okay <laughs> Uh, the, the one thing I would add is when I was listening to uh, directors Teal and Odoricio, uh, it occurred to me that one of the dilemmas we have is uh, so much of our uh, travel by personal vehicle, uh, not speaking of commercial vehicles as Steve was, but uh, so much of it is very hyper local. Uh, most of my trips these days are uh, within five miles of where I live. And so uh, transit uh, works very well for me to get downtown uh, from Southwest Denver. I live near Kipling and Bellevue. Uh, it took me, I never, I never drove downtown one day that I worked for RTD for those little over five years on the Eagle project. Uh, but my city council office is four miles away and I have no feasible alternative to get there other than to drive. So are we able, uh, uh, Rebecca and uh, Teresa, are we able to slice and dice our say our daily VMT data uh, so that we can see how much of it is long haul versus how much of it is short. And because it seems to me we're gonna need different uh, methods to address those if we're ever gonna reduce uh, a significant amount of it. Teresa, do you wanna take that one? I know you've been slicing and dicing. Yeah, I mean, and I, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, we are looking at, um, we have a whole team that's working on our statewide travel model and we are looking at the impacts of vehicles and then how, you know, what, what's, what's impacting it. So um, I don't know specifically if it, if it breaks it down long haul versus short. Um, and that's something I can look into and that's an excellent question. Um, but yeah, your be the behavior that you explained is something that I have heard um, from our travel modelers that many people are doing that um, because mm -hmm. of COVID. They're not really, they, they still are doing certain small trips to the grocery store, but very close to home. So um, yeah, I will look into the, those specifics. And I think that that's an excellent question. Thank you. 
Thank you. I ask only excellent questions. I see uh, uh, my uh, my former colleague at RTD and uh, actually a constituent of my council district, Bill Van Meter at RTD. I don't know. Uh, he was uh, invoked earlier, Bill. I don't know if you wanted to uh, to add anything to the conversation. I, I th I'm thinking it has progressed beyond the need at this point. Okay. To delve anymore. All right. Thank you. I want to uh, recognize Ron Papsdorf for some closing comments on this topic. Ron, you got you got the yeah, floor. Thank you, Dr. Flynn. I, I don't want to prolong this too much, but I did want to just take a couple of minutes first to thank Rebecca and Teresa for being here this afternoon. I know they're they're out talking to lots of different parts of the state, but the Denver region is just so big that we thought it was more uh, effective to bring them to a board work session to start this conversation. I think you've all gotten a flavor for just how complex this issue is. Um, just like Denver is a large complex region with lots of different transportation issues and needs. And I think, you know, you've heard through the conversation that there is no one solution. And in, in fact, transportation solutions by themselves are not going to help uh, help the state achieve the greenhouse gas emission reductions that are enumerated in law now. Um, it will take a variety of steps. And so one of the things that we're doing in our participation and in input into this rulemaking process is to make sure that it actually is workable for us as a region. Um, and that it gets gets us to gets us to the solution that um, will be required to demonstrate through through whatever the results of the rulemaking are to achieve the outcomes that um, are enumerated in House Bill 1261. Um, and that there needs to be room to address those variety of transportation needs throughout the region. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're, we're keenly aware of is that, you know, when CDOT says that their 10 year list of projects is sort of pretty well set in stone, they're really committed to that, that that constrains us as a region in terms of the investment decisions we can influence to help, help achieve this. And I think we want to work through that with CDOT. Um, and, you know, we've learned a lot through the 2050 planning process. We're really excited to bring that forward to the board uh, for your consideration because I think it, it's, it demonstrates important steps forward. But we have more conversations to have with CDOT about sort of investments and how that impacts the choices we can make as a region. Um, and then finally, I think the last point I would make for all of you to think about is, you know, if if large urban areas like Dr. Cog are going to be at the forefront of trying to implement this uh, from on the transportation side, um, and we're primary contributors to sort of the state's greenhouse gas emissions, then at some point we ought to think about whether the flow of revenues to invest in transportation to help us achieve those greenhouse gas emissions ought to take that into account. Um, not just sort of VMT, not just population, but, uh, you know, act, and, and not just lane miles of the transportation system, but where those investments can have the biggest impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So with that wrap up, I appreciate the time and um, there will be a lot more to come on this. Certainly, thank you, Ron. And for uh, those who are still wondering what ACEC means, uh, uh, Steve Conklin volunteers that it's the American Council of Engineering Companies for all those on your acronym bingo card. Our next item is uh, preliminary ideas for amendments to the Metro Vision. And Brad Calvert is going to lead that discussion. Uh, Brad, it looks like you are ready. Great. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Chair Flynn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm sure if you looked at uh, the, the materials for this item, you're probably recognizing that with only 30 minutes left in the meeting, we are not probably going to get through everything. Um, we do have a pretty good sense of where our milestone can be uh, to get uh, through uh, this afternoon and, and pick this conversation up in April. So I'm, I'm going to kind of, much like uh, Rebecca and Ron, I, I picked up the easy part of uh, the gig this evening and really going to kind of intro some of this. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Andy Taylor, to sort of run you through the primary uh, pieces of, of the presentation. Andy's also uh, helping by running uh, the, the slides for me um, at, at this moment as well. So I'll spend just a few minutes sort of orienting you all uh, to the larger process uh, to develop and bring forward uh, a revised MetroVision plan. Um, I will cover some of the things that we discussed quickly in February and then maybe also kind of give you a sense of some future conversations as well. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, so here's that sort of high level orientation that I just mentioned. If you'll recall, um, we actually did spend, spend some time in February uh, at the work session uh, talking about this same item. Uh, I have just a couple of recap slides that were shown in February that I'll, that I'll show here in a second. Uh, but in summation, the primary question that staff put to the board in February was related to a proposal uh, from staff about how we would sort of go through the mechanics or the process to uh, develop a series of proposed amendments for the MetroVision plan, uh, largely reviewing and incorporating key elements of aligned regional efforts, much like the conversation uh, that you just spent some time uh, talking about. Um, and in summary, what we heard in uh, February was the board was comfortable with the way that staff was suggesting uh, we move, move forward with this uh, work, um, but that really a crosswalk uh, of that would be helpful. And that's really what we're kicking off tonight is sharing uh, some sense of, of that crosswalk. We're using the presentation to hopefully illuminate uh, some of that. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, we are also intending to bring forward uh, additional items uh, for future conversations uh, with the board, uh, most notably performance measures uh, and targets. And then obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we'll probably have to continue uh, tonight's conversation uh, in April as, as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so I shared this exact same slide in, in February, but it is a good sort of recap. Uh, just for folks that maybe weren't uh, on the board at the time, uh, the process to uh, develop the current MetroVision plan I was about six years uh, in the making uh, with the board very active between like 2013 and 2016 to not only draft uh, key elements of the plan, uh, but to review uh, plan content. Um, since the adoption of the very first MetroVision plan in 1997, the Dr. Cog board has been uh, committed to a dynamic regional planning process, uh, meaning that the regional plan is assessed and amended uh, routinely. So as noted on the slide, uh, there were MetroVision amendments uh, adopted by the board in 2018 and 2019. Uh, we did not initiate uh, an amendment process in 2020 uh, because the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan was actively being uh, developed. Uh, and as, since that plan is out for public review and comment, we will obviously come back uh, and, and think about, and that's a big piece of this conversation, how an amended RTP um, ultimately uh, impacts the MetroVision plan uh, as well. Uh, next slide. Another slide that I'm repeating uh, from, from February, but I'm actually showing it for a slightly different uh, purpose. Uh, the blue triangle uh, on the right-hand side of the slide is a representation of uh, Dr. Cog's overall approach to organizational strategy. Uh, the MetroVision plan uh, picks up uh, that strategy work and what you see is that sort of 25,000 foot uh, altitude uh, at the overarching themes and objective or overarching themes and outcomes uh, level. Um, and, and really MetroVision carries that strategy all the way down to the bottom of the pyramid or the triangle at the, at the level of strategic initiatives. Um, in February, when I was sharing this slide, what I was describing to you is kind of maybe the, more the arrow on the left-hand side, uh, which is uh, a representation of staff's initial expectations related to how these staff proposed initiatives uh, informed by um, uh, those regional efforts may sort of appear to the board in terms of sort of volume uh, and intent. Um, in summation, uh, the higher the altitude uh, on that strategy, uh, the less likely uh, staff will initiate or suggest proposed changes uh, to the MetroVision plan. Getting closer to the initiative level, you may see sort of a higher volume of proposed uh, changes. Uh, and so why I'm showing this to you today is kind of an, an accountability check. Uh, this was sort of staff's expectation uh, going into this work. Uh, but Andy is going to spend some time orienting you to uh, the, some of the proposed changes uh, that we have come up with based on those uh, aligned regional efforts. Um, and so really, it's, it's obviously the board's purview to sort of check us uh, to make sure that we are sort of thinking about this uh, in the right way and that we are really, as staff, uh, we are viewing some of these changes you'll see tonight is really about plan organization, uh, maybe more so than changing intent uh, of the board within the plan, but, but you all should uh, make sure and, and keep that in mind and, and check us on that if you feel like there is an, an overstep or if we have undermined uh, clarity in the plan, uh, given how important uh, the board's role was in crafting uh, the plan as adopted. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of similar, same uh, sort of our or, uh, organizational approach to strategy, maybe just sort of reoriented um, very specifically to the set of proposals that you're going to see over the coming uh, months. Uh, we are proposing zero changes, no changes uh, related to Dr. Cox's mission or vision. 
uh, Nora's staff uh, suggesting uh, any adjustments to the overall themes uh, in the plan. I'm gonna present those very briefly in subsequent slides, mostly so that you can keep it as a frame of reference as you hear more about uh, the proposals that you'll hear about tonight. Um, and then you will hear uh, this evening a couple of suggestions related to outcomes. Um, next slide. But today's conversation is really focused at the objective level. Um, Andy will describe uh, the details and we'll get obviously as far as we can. Uh, but even at the outcome level, um, the, the, the proposals that you'll see tonight are really tied to suggestions about relocating uh, objectives uh, in the plan, at least from, from staff's uh, perspective. Um, just as a quick reminder of terminology uh, and, and our terminology objectives uh, basically refer to uh, continuous improvement activities. What continuous improvements need to be made uh, to achieve uh, those shared outcomes? And kind of a quick editorial comment as, as Andy and I were thinking about this, uh, this presentation, objectives are really a very, very important key component of the plan. Uh, we had sort of not lived through an experience of creating a, a regional plan that was so tied to organizational uh, strategy. And in the four years we've lived with the plan, it's just dawned on us how important those uh, objectives are. Uh, and they very, are, they very much are key drivers uh, of sort of future decisions and investments uh, that the board uh, considers. Um, so for instance, uh, speaking of the RTP, the regional transportation plan that I noted earlier, uh, the board approved process to evaluate candidate investments uh, in that regional transportation plan were, were, were very much guided by the transportation related objectives uh, in the Metro Vision Plan. So just, just, a, a, just a note about sort of the importance of the objective level uh, within uh, the Metro Vision Plan. Uh, next slide. So again, sort of, uh, you can go to the next one, Andy. Um, to give you a sense of how much I'm skating uh, in this presentation, I'm sharing the stuff that's not changing and Andy's gonna share with the stuff that is changing. Uh, so this is mission and vision uh, of the Dr. Cog uh, of the Denver Regional Council of Governments, um, really came out of a pretty large board governance conversation in the sort of 2014 timeframe, unchanged, uh, and, and the proposals we're bringing forward. Uh, next slide. Uh, no changes to the overarching themes uh, in the plan. Uh, these themes really do organize the content uh, and how the board expresses uh, those shared values in the Metro, Metro Vision Plan. So no changes uh, are proposed uh, to these themes. Uh, next slide, Andy. And so with that, I'm gonna sort of turn it over to Andy and see what we can accomplish in about 18 minutes. Um, just a note, we do have uh, some polling slides that we're going to use. We're trying to get to a milestone tonight that's taking the temperature of the board uh, related to some proposed changes. So if we can get through that first poll, that'll be really helpful uh, for us. Uh, as we have done in previous meetings, we are using minty.com. Uh, so if you really wanna get ahead of the game, you can go to minty.com right now so that you can enter uh, the code needed to participate, participate in the poll. Uh, that code is 3908182. Um, I'll ask either Lisa or Melinda to throw that in the, in the chat and then Andy will, We'll uh, read out that, that code again uh, when he's got the polling slide up for you. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. All right, thank you. And feel free to chime in, uh, Brad, especially as we get close to time. Uh, keep me honest there. Um, so uh, I get to advance uh, down that level of the triangular altitude uh, where there's a couple of staff proposed changes that start to show up. Uh, the first is with uh, the outcomes. Uh, so the outcomes, these represent a region-wide aspiration. They're written as though uh, that future condition is already present. Uh, and they're region-wide aspir aspirations that are shared by Dr. Cog, local governments, and other partners. The plan currently has 14 outcomes and staff's not proposing any new outcomes, uh, nor are we tweaking the wording of these outcomes. However, we would like the board to consider eliminating two outcomes. The content under these, the objectives that Brad was describing are still important. And uh, we, we have found places that are, that are logical places to rehome these objectives under different outcomes. Uh, staff is making this proposal as part of some other uh, objective level uh, reorganization that I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to walk you through through these slides. Um, the overarching theme that has these two outcomes that are currently uh, where these are currently housed is already one of the largest and wide ranging themes. And so that's, that's one of the motivating factors here. Uh, this would help make some more strategic space within that theme, we think, for additional outcome, uh, additional objectives uh, under the remaining two outcomes there. 
uh, it's hard to fit all the structure on this one slide. Uh, but uh, so uh, I've charted it out. Uh, if you want to follow this link uh, at your own leisure, uh, please feel free to, to to try and see kind of where some of this stuff is moving. Uh, slides, unfortunately, kind of lock me into trying to show this a little bit more linearly. So um, I want to just have this as, a, as an option for you, uh, if that helps. Um, a little annotation guide for the changes that I'm going to walk you through. Uh, as Brad mentioned, objective level is really where a lot of the focus is uh, for the staff uh, proposed changes today. Um, and uh, I've added this guide just to help orient you to some of the changes. Uh, there's a substantial amount of moving things around. Uh, so this is already board adopted text that may already be someplace else. So if you see a double underline, uh, that's MetroVision text that's already adopted. That's just uh, in a location where, where staff is proposing it could move. If you see a double strike through, that means that text is, is not being proposed to be deleted, but that's where it would have been originally as adopted. Uh, a single underline is our staff initiated uh, 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 additions that we're proposing and a single strike through would be a, a staff initiated deletion that that is not a part of a move elsewhere. Uh, there are some other notes and highlights to help uh, uh, keep track uh, of some of the different motivations and rationales around these. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to pause a, a moment and, and maybe address one of the why questions that could come up about why we would move all this this stuff around, especially if it's already in an adopted plan. Um, in short, our region is a complex and connected system. And so there's there's no one obvious way to sort the material that would go in MetroVision. And by the time we get to the objective and initiative levels, uh, the, the levels of doing the work to reach our shared outcomes or aspirations, we may be doing one activity that advances towards multiple outcomes. Uh, travel demand management, like what happens through our way to go program here at Dr. Cog may help address congestion uh, on, on the transportation system and its operations may help lower emissions. And it may also allow people and businesses to thrive and prosper. Those are three different outcomes related to three different themes as our plan is currently organized. Uh, but what we focused on when we were considering whether to move something or propose move something uh, is whether that structure best reflected the strategic work of Dr. Cog and others and whether uh, voluntary initiatives that, that are the next level down in that triangle would have a logical, a more logical home in the plan alongside uh, things of a similar nature. And so as I'll try and get through a couple of these with the time we've got left today, um, I'm tending to introduce uh, what it is, this, uh, this aligned initiative or plan or strategy uh, and where we see it potentially fitting in uh, in MetroVision, where it could be reflected uh, through staff proposals. And so we'll start with the Colorado water plan. Um, uh, the state created its first water plan while we were working on MetroVision. Um, and since that time, there has been a technical update. Uh, and uh, they did a lot of work as part of that technical update to understand uh, some scenarios to understand the potential supply gap that we could be facing in the future. The takeaways for us as a region may be different than those at the state level. Uh, first, there's a significant gap forecasted for the for future water for um, for agriculture. And second, urban growth and the form of that growth uh, will affect the demand uh, for municipal and industrial water needs. And so staff's proposal hopes to reflect that in MetroVision by recognizing that a big threat to agricultural capacity is, is water availability, not just land conversion uh, to urban and suburban uses as is currently reflected in the language in MetroVision. Uh, water demand is also connected. Uh, our urban and suburban growth pattern and the resulting demand for municipal water will compete directly with agriculture for that supply. And so uh, how we're showing that, uh, potentially how we're reflecting that in the staff proposal is to connect water supply to agricultural capacity, uh, moving some of the, the material we have related to uh, water use alongside uh, agricultural uh, uh, objectives here. Uh, we're also uh, hoping to reflect that connection to growth pattern by moving both of those objectives, actually three of these objectives, uh, alongside uh, from the environment section uh, to uh, an efficient and predictable development pattern theme. And just to show you where some of that's coming from, um, this shows you where currently some of that water use language exists in MetroVision. 
uh, this would move would allow uh, this section to focus on water quality and not water use, which is what most of it is related to at the moment. Uh, like the state water plan, this is another plan that was first created uh, during board deliberation uh, over uh, the 2017 version of, of MetroVision and it's since seen a revision. Uh, it's structured around six areas or priorities with 29 strategies. Uh, many of the ways that, that staff proposed to reflect this framework and its updates is at the initiative level, which we're not going to discuss today or, or next time. Um, the six priorities are reflected in various themes throughout MetroVision as currently adopted. However, we uh, noticed that two of the priorities helped us understand how we might focus the safe and resilient built and natural environment theme around climate and natural hazard resiliency and building an infrastructure sustainability. And so this is the most involved series of staff proposals. Um, and so I'm hoping to get through this and then get some feedback uh, with the time we've got left today. Um, here's where one of the outcome removals would, would, would potentially happen under staff's proposal with the open space outcome. Uh, the portion in green would move out of this theme to the urban growth outcome that we were just looking at with the water plan is how we grow helps shape what land is uh, available for conservation and restoration. It also helps keep uh, open space preservation initiatives alongside agricultural uh, land preservation initiatives since uh, some communities use agricultural operations as part of their open space and urban growth strategy. Uh, the portion in teal would move uh, to an existing outcome in the healthy and inclusive livable communities theme where there's already significant overlap uh, about connecting people to healthy and active choices. And so this is what staff's proposing here. And uh, as you can see, this is, this is potentially the, the new home for that, that portion in green. Uh, where that open space language, the objective and supporting objective there could move under staff's proposal. And you can see alongside that the agricultural objectives that we were just looking at. And then here's the other place where that, that move could happen. So we wouldn't really lose any uh, objective uh, level language with this staff proposal, but you can see uh, where it would potentially move. Uh, as, as I already noted, there's a, a strategic overlap here between this section um, already as there's there's already a supporting objective around uh, the regional trail network, which, which is which is directly related to a lot of the work about connecting people to natural resource and recreation areas. And I apologize for repeating colors uh, on this slide uh, that they're not uh, the same part of the same moves as before, as we just saw here's the second outcome. Uh, that staff is proposing for, for potential removal. Uh, we've already looked at where some of the agricultural capacity objectives could be rehomed with, uh, with water plan related moves. Uh, the remaining objectives have potential other homes based on some of the other changes uh, that we'll walk through related to uh, the accountable health communities work here at Dr. Cog, as well as the, the greenhouse uh, gas pollution reduction roadmap. Those are two other efforts that we're hoping to try and reflect within MetroVision. And so there's other places that, that this language would move. So while the, the, the outcome may, uh, may go away under staff's proposal, um, the, that objective uh, level language uh, may find a new home. And so with that, um, I will uh, switch windows here in a moment uh, to open up a live window for the questions. As Brad mentioned, uh, menti.com is where the survey is, is uh, taking place and the code is uh, 39081821882. I will shift over to that. And so uh, I've just presented you with a lot of different staff proposals. Uh, this is just a chance to share your initial comfort level on a scale of one to four with one being very uncomfortable and four being very comfortable. Uh, this is not intended to be a vote, uh, official or not, uh, but it's just to, to help us understand uh, where there may already be some consensus and where further discussion may be warranted. Andy, I have a question real quick. Do you, do you guys have like a, is there, is there a link I might've missed that just shows the red line changes or is this the only way to follow it? 
Um, currently, this is the only way to follow is through the slides. Um, if that would be a helpful um, uh, deliverable as part of this process, we can definitely get um, an additional document as part of uh, next month's materials. I, I would concur with that. Thanks, Tia. I just think like it's it's easier for me to be able to see the document in context of where the section is, see what's being said, whether it's moved to this section or removed, moved or removed. And when you could put your annotation there, I assume that's what you're doing anyway, and that you summarized the slides from that effort. So I'm hoping not to create additional work for you, but just for me, I it helps me just to kind of see the document since we're talking about modifying a document. Is that okay? Uh, yes, yes. And I, I should have mentioned that um, there are some slides at the end of this presentation that, that show it as written if you need to toggle back and forth. But yes, I can provide, I can clean up uh, that working document that we have um, to make that, that easily shared. So yeah, you're right. We, we do have something uh, that we could clean up and add some additional annotations to. Thank you. That'd be very useful. Thank you. Okay, are all the uh, are all the votes in? It looks like it's still moving. It is still moving. I've got twenty two folks in so far, and I don't know how many folks are participating. Okay, could you make it in the next minute, uh, folks, on the meeting, if you've gone to that link? I feel like there should be some Jeopardy music here. This is always the hardest part. They're, we're asking four questions all at once. So. Yes. Let me ask, are there any directors still waiting to do this? Uh, please unmute and say, I need another minute. If not, let's consider this closed. Yeah, it's still at 22. So I'm considering that we, we've got a lot of folks in. Um, okay. Do, does any director need more time? Unmute and say, yes, I need more time. Yes. Uh, yes, okay, there's one. Let's give it another minute. And then just a helpful tip for folks, Mr. Chairman, is to remind people to hit submit at the bottom of the screen. Seeing a lot of consensus around uh, the open space connection objectives to yes. moving to the healthy and active choices outcome uh, um, and, and the water use alongside the agricultural capacity objectives uh, seems to have um, some comfort with it. Um, and so it may just be focusing some initial discussion around um, moving uh, of the agricultural capacity and open space protection objectives uh, to uh, the, the, the urban growth outcome. Um, so we, uh, with, with the time we've got left, I know we don't have much. Um, if there's any, okay. there any questions or comments about that. Um, uh, all right, let's, uh, all right, let's close the voting. Uh, we have about a minute and a half till the PE meeting is supposed to begin. Mm -hmm. I want to give folks a chance to transition. Uh, I hope every director has had their opportunity to uh, weigh in on menti.com. Uh, okay, Andy, do you have enough information here to proceed? Yeah, I think we can pick this up uh, okay. uh, at, at another work session and, and go through some more of the changes um, and 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 see what the comfort level is with some of those, but this gives us some initial yes. feedback. Yeah, I think we'll have to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, uh, about half of us probably have to go over to the next meeting. So uh, seeing no other business here, I will declare that we are adjourned. Mr. And Chairman. Yes, Doug. This is Doug real quick. Um, for those that are attending the, the performance and engagement committee meeting, um, you, this is not the link, so you'll have to go to, to uh, your calendar invite and find the link there or yes. on our website. So we'll reconvene and let's say we'll start the meeting at 5.35. Okay, I see uh, Director Starker has uh, his hand up. Uh, Bud, go ahead. I'm just leaving. I'll see you later. Oh, <laughs> okay. <the> next meeting. <laughs> just being friendly. Very okay. well. <laughs> Thank Bye, you. Bud.
This meeting is ad adjourned. We'll see you all. Bye-bye. Everybody. Yeah.